you know, the South Korea is a culturally hot spot. And uh, however, the youth startups and uh, uh, jobs policies are challenged. We are living in a smart society, and at the same time, suffering from loss of growth engine. Searching for the solution, again and again, this big job and challenge. That's why we are here. We have four globally professional input providers today. And uh, let me introduce the first speaker, Dr. Perudun Hamdullah PhD in chemical engineering. And uh, now he is a president and the vice uh, chancellor of the University of Waterloo. University of Waterloo is so-called MIT in Canada and very strong in industrial cooperation and doing startup business school. So ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Dr. and President Hamdulapur, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind introduction, and good afternoon, everybody. Let me first uh, thank the uh, organizers of this event for their brilliant selection of topics and organizing this event as well. It's quite timely. It's especially it's timely for our industrialized uh, nations and at a time where we're facing some very important challenges. Let me try to focus on two specific areas that I believe will be of importance to the uh, audience we have today. The first one is the uh, contrast between our, what I call, status quo economy and, and the uh, startup-based economy. There is definitely a big contrast between the two as to how each one sees the world and the future. And the second one is how our universities and governments should work differently with a different mindset and understanding. And I'm gonna briefly mention about what I mean by this different mindset so that we can have better working relationships and better policies in place to enable things such as youth startups and entrepreneurship. Many of you have witnessed this, or some of you are so young that uh, uh, you're, you're, you're already in it, but for a person like myself, it is quite clear that our world has been spinning at a much, much, much higher speed than it was before, for various reasons. We don't have enough time to delve into these now, but it's very obvious. It's not the same world as was 10 years ago, even five years ago. It's, it's spinning at a much higher speed. So there's a synchronization issue between the speed at which the world is spinning and some parts that are linked to it, such as our universities, such as our universities and governments. We are spinning at a much lower speed. We're not really well synchronized. We're not, we need a lot of hard work to do in order to catch up with that speed, align, and then after that, make sure that we are able to spin at even higher speed provide the kind of leadership that right now our economies, our countries need. What is the uh, answer? How do we get around this? One will say that, well, innovation is the answer. We need to innovate constantly. We need to innovate everywhere in governments, universities, and our societies. But then we fall short of defining what that innovation is. In the most incrementalist sense, we say, well, innovation is something that if you can make a different product or make the same product cheaper and faster and more efficiently, that's innovation. It is a very narrow definition of innovation, but when finally I decided, well, needed to have a different definition, this is one of the articles I wrote, one of the uh, newspapers, that it is actually our, how do, we, how do we accelerate the society's capacity so that we are, our revitalization and growth can also accelerate. So we need to have a better understanding of what we mean by innovation. So how do we then bring it down to the many, many folks here, uh, the youth, that you will really understand the meaning of this innovation and 
take it and do something with it. What do we understand from this? So let me share some numbers with you. And I will also explain some bigger facts behind those. If you look at the unemployment, youth unemployment rates across some of the developed countries, across OECD, you will see that uh, I'm not very happy to see that 13.4 or 13.1 can in Canada or in the US and even in Europe it's even more dire and slightly better in Korea and in Israel uh, simply because of the fact that uh, military service in these countries is also considered to be employment but nevertheless it is something that we are concerned about. And you will also read in, on a daily basis in many North American newspapers that there is a big problem with our universities. We, are, we have surplus of university graduates out there, but our companies, but our uh, industries and private sector, they are in desperate need of talent, and they are not finding them in university graduates, which is, in a way, in my opinion, uh, uh, a false statement, because that is, that is simply not true when you look at uh, these numbers a little closer. There's also another element that nowadays, an expectation from a university grad that you will be career ready, you will be job ready. And this is again a very narrow and small definition of a university graduate. What we want to see, in addition to your career readiness, we want you to be well-rounded global citizens. We want, to be, we want you to be able to see the world, from a much wider perspective, and then link your career as to how you're linking with the broader work world and, and bringing your own career to that picture. So a university education is a lot more valuable and broader than the simple narrow definition of job readiness. However, that career readiness is also a very important factor without which I think our sustenance and the uh, health of our economies could not be sustained. So with that, let me also look at the growth rate, GDP growth rates in advanced economies, and it's quite sluggish, okay? And again, and uh, there are some fluctuations, but nevertheless, you don't see a huge big jump in a GDP growth rate. Where do we go from here? What kind of solutions are we looking for? Here is a big contrast. This is the, uh, this is the uh, contrast I was telling you about in the beginning. This is a study done by the Kauffman Foundation. It's a little bit dated, but it's, uh, it's, it's still quite telling that uh, existing firms are net job destroyers. Uh, in a seven year period that the study was conducted, those, they, the job loss was was over one million. Whereas the new companies, the startups, created three million jobs during the same period. And why is this happening? It's simply because existing firms, the status quo economy that I mentioned, even though we need everything they are doing, they are the same things. Our science, our productivity is advancing at, a, at such a rate that many of the functions of these firms, or the, uh, the, the, in the development, product development area of these firms, now can be done by sim simple algorithms, or by robots, or by machines. So the dependency on human beings for routine or semi-routine jobs is, is, is decreasing. If you look at startups, they are all new. That is the value of a really brilliant new university graduate that this person is in possession of such talent and knowledge and depth and breadth that no algorithm or machine can replicate them. And that's why the new, new firms, new companies, they are in constant need of that kind of talent, the kind of talent that I'm telling you about. And what kind of examples can I find you? The best place I can find you is from my own institution. How do we then accelerate this? How do we then broaden it. One way is to create the kind of environment that the students will flourish. My institution, um, the entry average to, go, go and, uh, to be admitted to the University of Waterloo is very high. It's very competitive to get in. Yet, 
In last year's undergraduate class, over 7,000 students, 48% of these students, they said they were coming to the University of Waterloo because they thought that the university will help them with their desire to become entrepreneurs, to have their desire to be able to start their own business, that they will find that environment. They didn't quite know what that environment will look like, but 48% is a very, very large number. And they thought that in addition to their very high level academic qualifications, that they could go to any graduate school or they could work for any company after their graduation, they thought that there was a very clear path for them to become entrepreneurs. So why is this? What's this environment? What does it look like? You have to create it. You can't just say that, hey, here is what, what we've done. We have bottled entrepreneurship. We put it in a bottle. If you drink three bottles a day for three months, you'll become an entrepreneur. Okay? It's not that. It is the environment that you create. One of the most important elements of that environment is what we do at universities, in addition to providing the best platform for education, is research, to look for new knowledge and share that new knowledge with everybody, including our students. So they have to be in an environment where questioning everything and finding the most important and the newest piece of information is one of the fundamental aspects of their education. Then, something very unique about my university, again, I would call it experiential education, but it's basically what we call cooperative education program that every student uh, who, are in this, who, is in, uh, who are in this program they have to go, after one term of studying, go out and get a paid employment in the field of their study and come back, do it five times. During that time, their, their experience grows tremendously and they're able to relate what they're learning to what's out there outside the university. That also helps them enormously start developing ideas by combining an excellent quality education they're receiving at the university, by finding absolutely the right examples or problems or opportunities, the workplace that they're working. Then combine it in the environment to, for them to become entrepreneurs. How, how does this happen? Um, we provide them with the space. We provide them with mentorship. We provide them with opportunities and we tell them it's okay to try something new. It is absolutely okay to try something new. If it doesn't work, do not stop. Don't worry, failure is okay. Get up, take risks, and do it again until you're successful. And there are many other pieces. One other important piece, it is very important to recognize the creativity of these individuals, either a student startup or a faculty startup, that if you create a new intellectual property, it is 100% yours, so it's a big, great big motivation that uh, it is presented to the students. So, right from day one, even they before, before they start uh, coming to university, there is this environment. In this graph, it's difficult to read, but basically the horizontal axis is time. First day they are at the university until they graduate, there is an environment. The upper half of that bar uh, line they are the academic programs, courses that's available to them. Uh, they can take and also get credit under. There are non-credit courses, but they are all, it's all filled with practical uh, and mentorship type of uh, experiences that each one of these students can benefit from. How are we doing with time, Mr. Chair? Two minutes? Okay. Um, We'll discuss more later. So let me again go back to the cooperative education thing. If, if, you, if you look at the graph, I, I, I just summarize it in uh, uh, three areas. One is employment. And I compared the graduates of our university with the rest of the uh, province of Ontario graduates. They find employment much faster and at higher rates than the rest of the province both six months after graduation and two years after graduation. They all find employment in the fields that they study, and again, for both periods. And more importantly, you'll find this quite interesting, that they earn more money. 
than the rest because they, all, they already have a lot of um, uh, information and experience that they will need. So let me summarize then. Why are we presenting all these? And what is it that we will expect from our governments? Because in the beginning, I said, governments and universities, we need to think differently. We need to enter into a different relationship. Governments, the best thing they can do is enable policies, new policies, so that there are incentives and there are encouragements in the form of various things, like from tax credits to uh, employment credits. And make sure that the ideas, the tremendously important, brilliant ideas that are generated by our youth, find a way, well, all of its way, either to the marketplace or other places where society benefits either economically, technologically, or in any other way that we can find, which is in need of stable funding from angel funding to initial seed funding to venture capital funding. So the stable funding is also very important. And the final thing is all of these, they require a very different DNA, youth startup DNA. That is, creativity is at the top. You have to think differently. You have to take yourself from outside of your narrow disciplinary area and look at the world from a much different way. Do not just think of one simple answer, that there are always more answers. Some of the answers that we discard say, well, it, it cannot be possible. Look at the possibilities of the impossible, okay? And creativity is more, is, is the most important piece here. Make sure you're a risk taker. At my age, I will be very careful taking any risk, okay? Um, for various reasons. Your age, youth, you can take many risks. It's okay to miss a meal, okay? Uh, there are many, many very successful entrepreneurs I know who lived through some very difficult times and craft uh, craft dinner macaroni and cheese was the uh, was gourmet food for them for a long time, but their perseverance paid off. So it's a different world. You have to equip yourself with different DNA, and that DNA includes risk taking, experience, and understanding the problems of the real world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, President. So, innovation and TNA at Waterloo, what a nice concept. And uh, since you say us uh, at least two minutes, so that's therefore uh, the audience will recognize that and somehow in return and they're trying to ask you a question later on. We are looking forward to that. Thank you for that. Okay, shall we move to now the Switzerland? And uh, Dr. Ralph Ahula, uh, president, ETH, Zurich, and originally his field is in uh, uh, particular physics. And uh, ETH, probably I think some of you might know that uh, it's so famous because Dr. Einstein graduated from. It's a, what a wonderful university there. So he's a uh, president, so why don't you welcome President Ahula. Please come. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, and I think we are talking about a very important topic, the employment rate of the young people. Imagine energetic young people and have nothing to do. They will start revolution, unfortunately, mainly violent revolutions. So the unemployment rate is, I think, one of the top <coughs> priorities for governments uh, to help. And if you see the unemployment rate in the OECD countries uh, with the bars, this is uh, December 2007, and uh, the dots then in March 2012, after the financial crisis, uh, I have marked uh, to the left Switzerland and Korea. They are doing not, not too bad, but some countries really experience a lot of a race of unemployment. There are maybe different reasons, but you see the 
the manufacturing will be done more and more by robots. It doesn't need people anymore. And also the, in the services. The uh, computers take up uh, simple services. You do your banking management, your bank account yourself on your computer. So a lot of jobs disappear. A few engineering and computer science jobs, of course, remain. And what remains is caring for a, a old people. It's tourism, it's entertainment. Uh, maybe these are the jobs for the future. <coughs> And uh, one really has to think hard uh, how to get the employment rate. And employment, employability has something to do with education. And here the correlation with the PISA mean test score and the economic growth. It's clearly correlated. The better educated people are, the better is the economic growth of the country. Uh, the educational system is also, uh, in this case, a key ingredient of the countries. Now, let me talk about my country, and I will give you two, uh, the education system and the startup scheme. 17%, it is not a typo, of the Swiss education degrees are only university degrees. This is very low in international comparison. And the OECD always tells us you should increase this because there's always a shortage of engineers in our industries, and, but we always resist it. If you increase this number too high, quality, of course, will also drop, and you need really top engineers uh, for the future uh, development of the country. But also, you have a lot of other jobs needed, uh, professional training, for the jobs, uh, also there are shortages. So we have 400 federal vocational exam, uh, training system, lifelong learning, and the important thing is you have to acquire the right skills for your profession. And where do you learn that? This is not only a theoretical uh, issue. This is also something, a practical training. Anyone with sufficient capabilities can also change, so the system is not locked, that if you once made your choice, which path you go. The unemployment rate situation is more than just one number. Uh, here, maybe you cannot read them all, I read them for you. There is, un in addition to unemployment rate, long-term unemployment rate, skill mismatch, how much formal education is there, are there working poor? They are employed, but don't make enough money for their living. Atypical working hours, temporary work, part-time work, and so on. And you, we made an index out of all these numbers, the labor market index. And if you look at it, the skill mismatch often is the reason for the unemployment. And uh, you look over time, and there, there is a mark of the financial crisis uh, uh, shortly after 2007, and you see here countries, Switzerland and Germany, they are more or less stable <coughs> job markets, but Ireland and Spain really dropped down after the financial crisis. And I have also uh, similar numbers for Korea, which is also so far a very stable <coughs> job market, which is good uh, because you also put a lot of attention to the education. But the Swiss education system has two possible paths. And before I explain it, uh, the academic on the left and the <coughs> labor intensive and the uh, <coughs> job market training, the most important thing are two things. You need social prestige in both parts. If you don't have social prestige, if you do an apprenticeship, nobody will do it. So the Society has to value these people, that this is uh, very useful for the country, and not everybody has to be an academic. The second most important thing is, are the arrows going from left to right and right to left? So once you made your decision, and you think during your career you made the wrong decision, it is transparent to <clears throat> move from one side to the other. So start me on the right side, there's a professional maturity certificate where people go only two or three days a week to school and have a professional training at the company and the company pays for it. 
because they see also in the long-term advantage. In the first two years, they have to invest in the student, and in the third and the fourth year, they really have already benefit. And uh, on the left side there is the Matura, where you go for eight or nine years to a high school and learn uh, a lot of things, uh, radical things, uh, human rights, uh, <coughs> languages, which, is what, which are very important. Then the maturity certificate, which are only 20%, uh, go to have a free entrance to university. And the first year university is a tough year where the strong examination after one year. So even if the high schools are different and uh, different uh, performance, you can catch up in the first year. You have to work hard on those who <coughs> make it. They will be fit for the study, uh, the master and the PhD. The, People with professional <coughs> education, those who want to learn more, go to a university of applied science, where you really do applied science, which are very close to product development. At a university, you never learn how to design a product. You are theoretical, educated. You know what to design something, which is maybe a problem in 10 or 15 years. You're well prepared. But in the university of applied science, you learn uh, product development for what you have to do in the next half year. So this is somebody who has a skill and can be employed at a company immediately. And uh, they can also uh, then go to, to the company or he goes makes a master and continues education. And each time, uh, if you are among the best, you have the possibility to move to the left side and have an education degree in the university where you, of course, have to learn all the basics. Now, universities uh, are measured by rankings. And if you are good, you like, you are proud to show it. But there's also a danger that everybody optimizes according to the criteria of the QS or Times Higher Education or Shanghai ranking. And uh, at the end, all the universities will be alike which is maybe also not good. Uh, one should have a diversity of education, a diversity of skills, and uh, that's why uh, one has to take them with uh, care, these universities. We are very international universities, 37 international students. Uh, from the third year, with all the language is English, and the faculty is also international. Now, these students uh, learn and make a PhD or a master and go to industry. Where is the entrepreneurial spirit? And this is something about 15 years ago we thought, there is something missing in our education. The entrepreneurial spirit is, is key. And uh, so for instance, if somebody had in his uh, master or PhD, uh, in basic science usually or engineering, has developed something which is not ready for commercialization. But it has a potential. Then we have some donors with private money give them one and a half year uh, extra time to bring their ideas towards the market. Either that they have their own company later on or they are connected with an industry where the product will be incorporated in their <coughs> design. Again, one important cultural thing is here. These people have to, be, have to be moved out of the academic environment. There, we put them all together in a different building where other entrepreneurial <laughs> spirits is in, in this house. Other students, they compete. They should not have academic ideas to maybe understand the Big Bang a little bit better, what happened uh, billions of years ago, but really have the focus on Customs, customers and on, on, on the product uh, development and uh, should be in contact less with professors but should be in contact with people from business. Those who already created a company several times, they are speaks a lot, and they are, they are volunteer to help to educate them. <laughs> and uh, we have already several of these uh, uh, 22 pioneer fellows and 17 teams, and a lot of companies already started this way. <coughs> so it is important that we have all this entrepreneurial spirit uh, <coughs> implanted in the student. Then, of course, students like competition. Then we make a business competition, and those who win 
get some little money, and the money is not the important thing, but it, it's a prestige. It will be published in the newspaper, and then the <coughs> venture capitalists come and say, ah, oh, this is a great spin-off uh, <coughs> from, from the famous university, and we will invest in them. For instance, uh, we create at the last few years between 20 and 25 companies every year. And they are successful companies. They don't grow very fast, but uh, they <coughs> grow of uh, one or two employees per year, uh, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, and they survive more than five years. So we made a study that they really are stable companies, so they are <coughs> maybe they didn't take enough risk, and that's why they didn't grow too far. So last year, 24 spin-offs, hundreds of patents registered, 319 cooperation agreement uh, and uh, over 10 million venture capital raised. Usually we don't know the exact numbers because some of the numbers are secret. So, <clears throat> but you see it started slow and uh, the idea to have your own company was implanted and uh, they start slowly competition and it's fun to have their own company. <clears throat> And if you fail, you try a second time. And so the risk taking is also something you have to learn what has to do with the local culture. So let me conclude. I said the economic growth is positively related to the education performance. The appropriate skills are needed by industry as a key success factor. So you have to write skills in the different industries and of course only these industries know what skills are needed. So this are the <coughs> young people have to learn that by doing and establishing the entrepreneurial spirit among the students. This was also a cultural change with competition, with little money, with environment which is entrepreneurial friendly with people voluntarily to help. This really took off 15 years ago and is now really a part of our university in Zurich. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, so higher education and dual uh, the apprenticeship uh, in the Switzerland, I think it's a ETH is kind of some kind of uh, a face finder. So wonderful. So later on, we can expect so further some detailed questions regarding that. OK. Now it's time to move to third speaker. And uh, Paul Swim, OECD, a senior economist, and uh, in the Directorate of uh, Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs in analyzing employment issues. So why don't you welcome, please, and uh, the poor Christian. Thank you very much. I'm sure all of you, like me, um, found the first two presentations really interesting, and, and for my part, I'd say inspiring, too, how excellent universities, both in Canada and Switzerland, are doing a really good job of combining basic education, advanced education, with also fostering entrepreneurs among their, the young students as they enter into the uh, economy. I'm going to take a somewhat different um, approach to my talk and talk instead about my, uh, some ideas I had based mostly on OECD studies about the role that fostering youth startups can have in the context of the Korean labor market and in particular how the high level of duality in the, in the labor market in Korea needs to be addressed at the same time that you try to um, encourage greater high productivity, innovative entrepreneurship among the youth. In terms of the, the way I'll develop my argument, uh, first I'll describe labor market dualism in Korea in general and then uh, focus somewhat more specifically on how it affects highly educated youth, many of them adversely. Having diagnosed uh, that general problem, I'll also then talk about what the cure might be to that, starting with general policies to reduce labor market dualism and eventually focusing in on 
skill-related policies, including those to promote entrepreneurship by young university graduates. First of all, what do I mean by dualism? I think this is a much discussed topic in Korea, so um, you, you, all, you all know this in the sense that uh, what the general idea is that workers tend to be divided between those with good career jobs, sometimes called regular work jobs, but there's a substantial number of workers in non-regular jobs that not only do less well in the sense of paid less and have less stable jobs, but also uh, can't make proper careers. One way to try to put, make that quantitative, just what this non-regular work problem is, is that a chart here compares Korea with other countries in terms of how many workers are in jobs with temporary contracts. Contracts. See, in Korea, it's about, the Korea is the blue bar, most of the way to the right. It has one of the highest proportions of temporary jobs. About one in four workers are in jobs that are designed not to last very long. And because they don't last very long, not surprisingly, employers don't train these workers very much either. Um, and I, sh I guess I should add here, because it's, I know it's a controversial issue here, non-regular work is not exactly the same thing as temporary work. There's other workers that probably fit in the, the definition as well. But in terms of trying to compare Korea with other countries, this is the best way to show that quite a high proportion of Korean workers are in jobs even considered non-regular. What's it mean? What are some of the effect, bad effects of this? One is that um, certain workers have to move between jobs very rapidly, so they don't have much stability. This chart shows uh, the total number of jobs that either end or start up during a year. And you can see Korea is all the way at the far right. It has more job turnover than any other OECD country where we can get these measurements. And uh, it's not the case that all workers face in unstable conditions. There are a lot of workers in stable career jobs, but a lot of workers too are changing jobs several times a year even. Another of the bad outcomes is that the non-regular workers tend to be paid a lot less than regular workers, and that shows up in this chart as earnings inequality measures. And I have two measures in, the, in this chart. Both of them, Korea is all the way at the right with the most wage inequality that you see in the OECD, although about tied with the United States, which is another advanced economy that has very high level of wage inequality. Finally, um, to my mind, maybe the worst uh, or most concerning aspect of dualism in the Korean labor market is it's not so bad if certain people, especially young people leaving school, are in temporary jobs for a year or two. But the question is, can they use that as a stepping stone to move up into good career jobs? This chart shows what fraction of workers in non-regular jobs in one year move into a regular job the next year. Because regular and non-regular jobs aren't exactly the same in every country, don't take these numbers as, as absolutely um, <clears throat> quantitative indicative, but it's clear that Korea has very low um, escape rate from non-regular jobs compared to other countries. It, it's much harder here to move into regular career jobs. And so that suggests that quite often non-regular work can, at least there's a risk it becomes a long-term trap for the workers affected. So to sum up the uh, diagnosis of the labor market problem, is that the dualism is quite extreme in the Korean labor market and that uh, it exists for a reason that the employers find it as a way, a necessary strategy they feel to, for them to uh, get have the flexibility and cost competitiveness, competitiveness they need. And of course the challenge then for Korea is to find other ways to give firms, uh, allow them to be competitive without consigning a quarter or a third of the workforce to jobs that don't give them good good careers. The other thing I didn't show any data on, but it's true, is three groups are particularly affected by non-regular work. Women, older workers near retirement age, or beyond the corporate retirement age, but near when they retire from the labor force, and then youth, people just less, left school recently, which is the group I'll eventually focus on because it's the one that concerns this um, um, session. In terms of the things you might do, to, governments might do to reduce dualism, you have to attack the overall problem. And there, the basic issue is to redesign the economy and labor market so the employers don't find it so attractive from a bit, as a business strategy to have a high number of non-regular workers. 
And this is sort of advice the OECD gives to Korea all the time. A lot of the advice the government's been working on, and I think uh, probably some progress has been made, but there's more to be done. The sort of top uh, policy approaches are to reduce the difference in job stability uh, regulations between regular and non-regular workers, to make sure that uh, employers enroll all their non-regular workers in social insurance schemes like the medical insurance and the public unemployment insurance, because if you don't do that, then there's a cost advantage to employing non-regular workers. Anyway, there's a number of things you can do to reduce the economic incentives for firms to rely heavily on non-regular workers. Also, each of the three groups I mentioned who are at the highest risk of being trapped in non-regular jobs, they have specific group-specific issues that need to be dealt with. Just to illustrate that, with women, it's usually the difficulty of combining being a mother, raising your children, and also having a good career. That the regular jobs tend to be demand long hours, working hours, and inflexible working hours. That expectation plus the relative scarcity of good childcare makes it very difficult for a woman who's engaged in taking care of her children to also maintain a career job. Um, in terms of youth, which I'll, I'll focus on um, most of the rest of the, my, my talk, the uh, big issue there is that you have a huge increase in the recent decades in the number of youth with university or tertiary degrees, and that growth in highly educated youth has outrun the demand for young people with those sorts of qualifications. So there's a skill mismatch between the skills the youth have and the ability of the labor market at this point to productively employ those skills. One example of that, that uh, there's that, that mismatch is presented in this graph. This graph shows what's sometimes known as the NEET rate. NEET is the letters N-E-E-T, which stands for not employed in education or in training. So it's the youth that are neither working nor actively uh, attending school, improving their human capital, hence their um, career prospects in the future. This chart shows that for uh, youth with the college, of the tertiary education, so at least the first level university degree, most countries, the NEET rate is much higher for low educated youth than for high educated youth. Korea is an exception, that the, the getting into work is particularly hard among youth for the ones with the most education, because there's so much competition for university level, level jobs. And about one in four are, neither working nor enrolled in school or in, an, in an, a training program. What might you do about uh, that skills mismatch problem? Here, uh, I think it was the first lecture, somebody mentioned about the need to synchronize universities with the economy. I think essentially that, that is also something that in Korea needs to be done to better align the skills National, what, what the OECD has been calling the national skills system with the labor market and its needs. And uh, there's really three areas where you have to look at. One is that the, you're developing the right skills that the economy needs. But in, in the case of Korea, maybe it's even more important that the skills that you have can be employed productively in the economy. People actually get jobs, and they get jobs that make good uses of their skills. And uh, I want to just talk a little bit more about this, this issue of skills mismatch in, in Korea and then get, move, get on finally to youth uh, startups. This uh, chart shows differences between older workers near retirement age on the left of the arrows and younger workers who just left school at the right end of the arrow in terms of their literacy skills. And the background here is that um, if any of you went to the opening session this morning, the uh, head of the World Bank mentioned several times the OECD is quite well known for testing 15-year-olds around the world for how well they're doing in school, how much they're learning. A year or two ago, we also started testing the working age population on somewhat more generic skills. And what this shows is in some countries, and Korea is the, the uh, extreme ex exemplar of this, the difference between people who are 60 years old today and the people who are 25 years old in terms of their education skills is just enormous. Other countries at the top, like the UK and the US, where uh, higher education diffused, became a mass phenomenon earlier, there's not that much difference to p 
people, young people earning, entering the labor market aren't that different from the people retiring. In Korea, it's a huge difference. And so you can understand why as jobs free up and people retire, often those are not the jobs that the new university graduates are, are looking for. This chart's a little harder to read, but it relates to the fact that a lot of older workers don't have very much education. Korea is almost all the way to the right, but the chart here sh is showing adults in the workforce who have low levels of skills, and the three data points here are essentially the bar is very low skills, and then the other two figures above it are pretty low skills and medium low skills. And it's how much access those three groups have to getting training, mid-career training, uh, the term lifelong learning was used a little earlier, to improve their skills once they're out of the, out of their, uh, out of, into the, in the world of work. And in Korea, the, those, those um, opportunities are pretty rare, which means that the, uh, in terms, of especially the older workers, not much chance to, second chance to catch up. Um, this chart, it's hard to read, but the vertical axis is the difference in pay between men and women. So the gap here, the higher you are, is the more, the, the, the greater the difference between men being paid more than women. And then to the right is the, also the difference between men and women, but in terms of how demanding their jobs are, in terms of having to use advanced problem solving skills. Korea is, is, is up high on towards the right, which means in Korea, women are paid a lot less than men, and they also use a lot less of this high level skill on their jobs. But what you can't see here is that women, especially young women in Korea, are very educated. So th this is the problem of a lot of highly skilled people not getting jobs that really make use, best use of their skills. One outcome of that is they're not paid nearly as well as they could if they had appropriate jobs, but also it leads to lower productivity than if the economy were able to take use, make, make good use of their skills. What might you do about um, these skills problems? A lot of things, well let me focus just on, because I think I'm running short on time, how youth startups promoting that is one part of the solution to this skills mismatch and uh, getting highly educated youth into the labor market in appropriate uh, positions where they can really contribute maximum amount to the emergence of a more creative, knowledge intensive economy. If to the, the potential for this is to do good is uh, these policies is really high for two reasons. One is in terms of the individuals themselves, it gets them out of this trap of being stuck in unemployment or underemployment and non-regular jobs, even though they're highly skilled, they studied very hard for years, if they can start their own business and do well, then they get the uh, reward. But also the economy as a whole will bene benefit as well. On the other hand, um, it will, it's, it's not easy to, to, to uh, implement the solution, and it's not a total solution to the problem. We heard earlier that universities, the top universities can do a good job of helping some of their students who are innovators in technologies to commercialize those activities and, and, take, and start up businesses. But that's not gonna be probably a huge number of, of youth, at least not, not initially. But also, um, in terms of Korea, um, my sense is it, it also requires kind of rethinking what self-employment and business startups are, are about. Uh, one OECD study that I find really interesting in, in this respect is we asked, had surveys uh, asking entrepreneurs who had recently started a business why they started their businesses in different countries. And it's really striking that in Korea, almost nobody said they started a business because they thought it had a great idea and they could really uh, improve the world or make lots of money. It tended to be more defensive reasons like why well, I was unemployed and, and uh, or do any jobs I could qualify for were really bad. I think part of that is because a lot of business startups in Korea are people who reach their corporate retirement age, say 60, they leave their career job, they can't find another good job as an employee, so they start up with their, uh, their spouse, maybe a little restaurant or a little supermarket or something. And um, what we're really talking about with youth startups is not having youth start up little restaurants and so on, although if you're, if, if you a really good cook and want to, sure. But we're talking about high productivity, high educated youth using their skills well. And I just want to point out that, that that's a form of entrepreneurialism that exists in Korea, but it's not the standard model. And so you have to think about uh, all the 
systems like how banks lo loan to small businesses, they're not going to be used to thinking about uh, this model of highly educated, innovative firms being set up by university graduates. So be, there'll be a lot of adjustments that have to be made for that model to, to, uh, to be effective. And then uh, this slide, I'll just end, end with it. Um, we, we did a study at the OECD in a number of countries about things they were doing to promote youth entrepreneurship. I think it's not hugely relevant to the topic here because in most of the countries we studied, which are majority Euro European countries, the interest was more in the low educated youth who were disadvantaged youth, helping them to start kind of low, the low uh, level businesses I was talking about before, of little restaurants and so on. It's not what we're, what's most relevant for Korea, which is highly educated youth uh, using their leveraging their knowledge to, to start innovative new businesses. But one of the things that did come out of this, which is useful, is that you really need a comprehensive set of supports. It's not one or two things you can do to help these people, these business, new businesses succeed. It's a whole range of supports you need. And that's another again, reason why I found the two earlier presentations very interesting, because they pointed out that for the un universities, they had to do, make a lot of adjustments to come up with comprehensive program to nurture and foster startups. And I'm sure with all the adjustments needed for the Korean context, the true, same will be true in Korea. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think it's, uh, we have uh, wonderful input so far. And uh, time is good. Now it's only 40 minutes ever since. So we can save time. So. Uh, same token, and uh, may I request final speaker, Paul. Uh, I'm sorry, Tom. And uh, Tom is a senior futurist and executive director of Da Vinci Institute. Uh, he studied in uh, uh, engineering ergonomics, and uh, now he's more uh, doing research in the area of human factor engineering. And uh, before launching the Da Vinci Institute, uh, more than 15 years uh, involved in IBM as an engineer and designer. So please welcome Tom. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, at the Da Vinci Institute, we have um, a phrase that we use about entrepreneurship and that that entrepreneurship is the French word for too stupid to quit. Um, and I actually take a lot of pride in that definition as an entrepreneur myself, that it conveys a lot of determination and willingness to do whatever it takes to make things happen. Um, at the Da Vinci Institute, we actually have a, a consulting arm called the Visionarium where we work on different techniques for stretching people's imaginations into the future. And uh, I'll, I'll use some of those techniques today. But the, how does the future get created? The future actually gets created in the minds of everybody around us. Uh, people make decisions today based on their understanding of what the future holds. So I use this phrase a lot, the future creates the present. This is just the opposite of what most people think. Most people think what we're doing today is going to create the future, but from a little different perspective, it's these visions that we have in our head determine our actions today. So if we change people's visions of the future, we change the way they make decisions today. And so that's my job. I'm here to change your vision of the future. And as a result, you're going to walk out of here making different decisions. So we'll see if we can make that happen. My favorite physicist, Max Planck, says when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. I was asked a year ago to come to Korea to give a talk at uh, the Global Sports Marketing Forum. Um, this is an ad event in advance of the, the Olympics that are coming in a, in a few years here. And so we talked about some of the things happening in the sports world. Uh, 1997, as, um, there, was, there was kind of a fundamental event where uh, a prize was, was offered for the first person that could actually beat, um, uh, create a computer that can beat the world chess champion. So IBM took uh, that challenge 
seriously in 1997, and they pitted their deep blue computer against Gary Kasparov, the reigning champion, world chess champion, and actually beat Gary Kasparov. In 2011, IBM staged another similar event where they, uh, they pitted their IBM's Watson computer against the two reigning champions in the, the game show Jeopardy, and actually the, uh, the Watson computer beat the, the game show champions. So do we run the risk of having driverless car, cars win all of the sport, the racing uh, events? Do we run the risk of robots uh, ruining boxing or basketball or, or golf? Um, we're actually asking the wrong question. Um, because competitive sports ends up being the ultimate form of storytelling. Um, in each of the competitive sports, there's human drama that's unfolding. You have contests with good guys and bad guys, depending on which side you're on. Um, you, you can witness these people overcoming adversity. You see the triumphs of the human spirit. And there's always an unknown outcome, and it's all happening in real time. So competitive sports is the ultimate form of fresh content in a world um, where, relative, uh, where relevance is gauged by timeliness and hyper-awareness is our competitive edge. But at the same time, we only want to see humans competing. We're also re-engineering athletes, and that, that changes a few other things. We're re-engineering the equipment that athletes are using. We're re-engineering the food that they're eating so they're uh, healthier uh, athletes, and we're genetically modifying athletes. Um, in the process, we're beginning to start creating super babies. And this idea of creating super babies creates a lot of interesting questions. Will super babies be allowed to compete um, against um, other people? And are superhumans still human? And will people still pay to see superhumans compete? Again, we're asking the wrong question. I mean, to reframe that thinking, could there possibly be another use for superhumans besides sports? I think there indeed are lots of uses for superhumans. This technology of creating superhumans, though, is what I call a catalytic innovation. This is dis different than disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is, is causing corporations to do more with less. Catalytic innovation is uh, the term I used to describe uh, new innovations that create entire new industries. In the past, examples of catalytic innovation are things like electricity, automobiles, airplanes, telephones, photographs. All of these went on to create multi-billion dollar industries. But here's the deal, all industries are a bell curve. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And yes, all industries will eventually end and get replaced by something else. But most industries today, most of the profitable ones that are in the news all the time, they tend to be in the second half of the bell curve. They're constantly being forced to do more with less. I'll use this example of, of peak steel. Um, Projections are that we're going to reach the peak demand for steel in the world in 2024. Uh, after that time, we will have developed composite materials and the overall demand for steel will start to decline. Now there's a parallel bell curve with the employment in that industry. The peak employment in the steel industry actually happened in the 1980s. In the US, as an example, we employed three times as many people in the steel industry in the 1980s as we do today, but we produce far more steel. This is what we refer to as technological unemployment. Uh, this idea of having to do more with less. And I've been predicting that by 2030, over two billion jobs are going to disappear. Now this isn't intended to be a doom or gloom forecast. This is intended to be a wake up call. Um, we're going to have to replace the jobs that are going away at a faster rate than ever before. And we have to create the systems for doing that. 
This is what I refer to as the level problem. Now, a lot of us have this tool in our garage. This is a, a level that we use to level pictures on the wall. But once we are able to download an app onto uh, our smartphone, a level app, then suddenly we don't need to buy that tool. That means that we don't have to have somebody that manufactures the aluminum frame, that manufactures the glass bulbs, that uh, assembles it all, the shipping and receiving, the, the stores that have to handle that. So every time we download a mobile app, we eliminate a piece of a job. And it's a very tiny piece, but when we're downloading billions and billions of mobile apps, we're el eliminating lots of jobs. So at the same time, we're freeing up human capital. But just because there's not enough jobs in the world doesn't mean that we've somehow run out of work to do in the world. That's fairly preposterous. There's always going to be things to do. But are we going to have jobs lined up for all that work that needs to be done? That's a whole different question. So where will our next generation jobs come from? The answer is they're going to come from future industries. And these future industries are going to get created by today's young people. I'm going to quickly go through 10 future industries. And these future industries are just scratching the surface of lots of other future industries that are coming about. The Internet of Things, as an example, we're creating lots of uh, unusual products in the Internet of Things. Uh, Cisco said that this, this actually got started somewhere between 2008 and 2009. That's when the number of devices connected to the Internet exceeded the number of people on Earth, 6.8 billion people at that time. The projections are now that there's going to be over 50 billion things connected to the Internet just by 2020. That's just less than six years from now. A year ago, there was a, uh, an event held in San Francisco called the Trillion Sensor Summit. They were charged with coming up with a roadmap for when we will reach a trillion sensors in the world. And they concluded that it'd be somewhere around 2024. And then by 2036, we will have 100 trillion sensors in the world. These are heat sensors, water sensors, moisture sensors, humidity sensors, all kinds of different sensors. What this is indicating, though, is that sensors are going to become very cheap and inexpensive and very ubiquitous. We're going to have sensors everywhere that, uh, so we're going to get information off the sides of cars, off the sides of buildings, off the sides of bridges. And, uh, and what we do with that information is the foundation for lots of new industries. Innovation's being parsed into far smaller pieces, so that's enabling all of us to participate in it. Uh, it's being democratized. I'll, I'll tell you about some of these enchanted objects. These are uh, Internet of Things products that have special qualities to it. The Amazon trash can is a fascinating one. Every time you throw uh, a can away or a product away, it scans the barcode and it orders a new one of those products for you to be delivered to your home. Uh, the MemoMe Smart Mirror it remembers what the last clothes that you tried on, so then you can compare your new outfit with your, the last one you tried on. The Vitality Glow Cap is one that reminds you to take your medicine. If you forget to take your medicine, it, the light will start flashing on it. If you still forget, it'll start chirping. And if you still forget, it'll start sending you text messages. The ambient umbrella is one that's very smart. It knows what the weather is. So it will remind you if you're walking out the door and it's going to be raining that afternoon, the, the handle on the umbrella will start flashing you to remind you to take it with you. These are the smart chopsticks were developed by Baidu, the Chinese search engine company. These are a piece of technology that will test your food to make sure it's safe for you to eat it. Uh, the Pinto Pet Feeder is one that enables you to actually dispense food for your pet while you're at the office. And then when the food comes out, then you can, then you can FaceTime your pet and actually talk to your pet um, because they don't like to eat alone. The second one is big data. We're going to be getting information from everything around us, so what are we going to do with all of that? 3D printing is going off in a thousand different directions. Everything from biological structures to printing uh, buildings to printing new products. Um, contour crafting 
is a version of 3D printing that's enabling us to print entire houses. Uh, the Chinese actually demonstrated that they could print 10 houses in one day. Atmospheric water harvesters are able to suck moisture out of the air. Um, the ones pictured here are the work of water towers that can actually extract up to 100 liters a day. And this, is in a small village in Africa, this changes everything. The young people don't have to be walking countless hours to, to bring water to the village. Driverless cars are, are going to be entering our world baby step by baby step, but it's going to happen much quicker than most people think. Um, driverless cars are going to change transportation in some very fundamental ways. Flying drones, this is another one that's going to go off in a thousand different directions and actually uh, be involved in lots of different industries. Cryptocurrencies are, are kind of redefining not only what we think of as currencies and how we, um, how we make our transactions, but also the tools for making those transactions. Ultra high speed transportation, um, there's people working on this. Daryl Oster is actually coming to Korea in a couple weeks to, to talk about this. He's the inventor of ET3, uh, evacuated tube transportation. Once you take all of the air out of a tube and you have a maglev track for the capsule to travel on, you can achieve speeds of up to 6,000 kilometers an hour. And a trip from Seoul to Washington, D.C. could be done in, in two hours. Uh, the last one I'll talk about is micro colleges. Uh, this is a special project we're working on at the Da Vinci Institute. I predicted that by 2030, half of all traditional colleges are going to go away. That doesn't mean we're going to need less, less education. It means that um, um, we're actually going to need more education, but different kinds of education at different pace, times of our life. So to define the problem, we need to prepare students for jobs that don't exist using technologies that haven't been invented to solve problems we don't even know are problems yet. In, in February, Facebook bought the company called Oculus Rift for $2 billion. This is a very interesting technology. It enables you to enter the world of virtual reality and uh, and experience things in all different ways. It's good for gaming, it's good for simulations. At the same time that that happened, um, there is an uptick in the number of jobs for virtual reality designers, engineers, programmers, and nobody was teaching that. Certainly nobody was teaching the Oculus Rift version of it. So bold companies like this are triggering instantly triggering the demand for talented people with skills aligned to grow with cutting edge industries. Um, these things are happening on an ongoing basis. So by 2030, we're projecting that the average person will have to reboot their career six times. Things are changing very quickly, and somebody who reboots their career wants to do it in the least amount of time possible. A micro college the way we define it is an immersive form of post-secondary education that's done in the, in the shortest period of time possible. Um, it's no longer possible to predict the needs of business four to five years in advance. That's what traditional schools will need. Micro college are this responsive framework for instantly going in on the messy front end and meeting the fluid demands of business. So at the Da Vinci Institute, we have a micro college called Da Vinci Coders, and we're teaching people to be computer programmers in a 13-week course. And they're getting entry-level jobs in the programming profession. They, they end up leaving with a certificate. It's not accredited. It's not, they're not getting a degree or anything, but they are getting jobs. We view micro colleges going off in lots of different directions, including everything from 3D printer uh, product training uh, crowdfunding, dog breeders, um, uh, becoming a brewmaster at a brew pub, drone pilots, aquaponics farmers. Uh, again, it's going to go off in lots of different directions. So we're exploring ways for um, uh, creating a learning laboratory and also a specialized maker space just for creating new courseware. The future is ours to write. We're entering into a period of unprecedented opportunity. 
So why is this period so important? Humanity's going to change more in the next 20 years than in all human history. At the same time, our risk factors are increasing exponentially, and our children's children who haven't even been born yet are depending on you. That's the people in this room. As Steve Jobs likes to say, right now is one of those moments when you are influencing the future. But sometimes our best efforts just look a lot like this. Yeah, pretty much like that. <laughs> Thomas Edison says opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. So for more information about what we do at the Da Vinci Institute or the Visionarium, um, feel free to sign up for our free newsletter. And I thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And uh, uh, thanks to cooperation by four speakers, uh, we can save 10 minutes. So put together, and we have now 20 minutes. So wonderful opportunity for me to invite all of you uh, give us wonderful question. I have uh, more than 20 questions in hand already, eh? and I'm now reading that. And uh, I think this, uh, uh, before we, uh, I, before I utilize these uh, questions, and then by selecting some of them and ask them, and then may I invite one or two of you from the floor and just give us your oral questions. Then uh, I will, uh, ask right speaker to respond. Okay, we have three in the front side, and uh, three uh, there, but of course, Madam first. Would you please identify yourself? And I try to be very clear in the brief, in comments or questions. Please go ahead. 창의적인 일이 국가 정책이나 사회 제도에서 허가되지 않았지만, 그렇지만 반드시 미래 사회에 필요한 것이라면, 우리는 어떻게 해야 되나요? Did you get it? Okay. And uh, just a minute. And uh, before you respond, and uh, maybe may I invite one more, please? And uh, okay, there. Okay. okay 네, so 두 번째 발표해 주실 말씀. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, uh, if you uh, just agree with me that maybe that's the best way to save the time is maybe I can make sure the fair distribution in terms of the speaker and the questioner. So why don't you uh, just allow me to ask the gentleman uh, next to you to ask questions, okay? Okay, please, please stand up and identify yourself and ask. Okay, okay, go ahead. Please, yeah. It's Korean or English? Huh? No, I say it's welcome. English is okay. Go ahead. You, go ahead, please. No, it doesn't work. Uh, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, firstly, thank you for the um, good speech. Um, I just want to ask Ralph Ala and um, Ferdium Hamdouf. I, I, I don't know if, that, if I got that right. I, I'm sorry. But um, I just want to ask one thing about, like, um, uh, uh, the University of Waterloo and the University of ETH Zurich um, does many different uh, ve uh, various programs to um, solve these youth um, jobless problems. But um, what can be done for these um, problems in developing countries or third world countries where there isn't enough funds or research institutes to um, have these programs? What it, What needs to be done or is there anything that um, is going on. Okay, go ahead. Let me attempt uh, briefly uh, answer both questions. For the first question, I don't think that creativity can be can be put in a confinement. Whether there's uh, it's encouraged by national governments or policies, creativity will will, will come because. It's needed. It's 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 the society needs different things. Our world is evolving uh, very fast. Therefore, if we are not creative, we are falling behind time. Somebody else will come up with this. So I don't think that we should wait for the governments or anybody else to encourage anybody to be creative. If you're creative, you will see the uh, direct results. In terms of um, 
the creating an environment at our universities to encourage entrepreneurship. And you're right, uh, right now, across the OECD, uh, as, the, as, as my colleague mentioned, if you look at the OECD average, 80% of the jobs are held by university grads as opposed to 55% of them held by high school or equivalent diploma. So the opportunity for university grads to get a job is much higher than non-university grads. Having said that, how do you bring it to the other economies? I think one big thing that has happened around the globe is the availability and accessibility of information by anybody. And that's, again, we talked about internet and you know the, the, the wonderful world that we have immediate access to information we want. So it could be used, again, for the same purpose so that entrepreneurship culture, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial environment could be equally shared with other economies that are not as advanced as some others. Go ahead, yes. Yes, uh, you usually in high technology countries think uh, the best product, uh, the most sophisticated, the mo it's, uh, it's also the best on the market. It is not true. It just has to be good enough because the best usually is too expensive. So uh, to sometimes very simple solutions are also ingenious. So, uh, so for instance, uh, we say our students, you should go to developing countries and see what they need and come up with solutions which maybe for the country is, is the best solution. For instance, architecture. Uh, <clears throat> so we have a, a hub in, in Singapore, which is not a developing country, but if it's close to, to, uh, <coughs> to Indonesia, to Malaysia. So from there, they go and look at the flooding in, uh, in Jakarta and, and come up with solutions uh, which are not expensive. Uh, so money is not always the only problem. You need local solutions and you have to team up with local people to tell you what the need is of the local people and then come up with local solutions. Okay, thank you. Okay, and... Uh, could, could I weigh in on that as well? Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, implied in that those questions are that you somehow need permission to become an entrepreneur. Um, that's, that's the opposite end of the equation. So you don't need the permission, you just start a business. Okay. Um, you, you need the determination and the motivation to do that. And it works best if you're surrounded with like-minded individuals. And how that, how that happens can be uh, constructed in a number of different ways. But oftentimes, universities are a safe environment, and that's the opposite end of the spectrum of what you need for becoming an entrepreneur, which is a risky uh, environment. Thank you. Uh, I have more than 30 questions with me. And uh, I appreciate them, wonderful active participation. And uh, I have read through very quickly and a uh, couple of points uh, I have in mind. So for the remaining time, uh, we will summarize uh, some points so that I can ask each of the four speakers to respond in their own way. Number one, Korean generations suffering uh, many, many reasons. One of them is that there is tremendous mismatch between what I want and what I am good at. This mismatch is horrible to some young generations, and they have no idea how to tackle this issue. I mean, they say, how can I identify my needs? Today, my need is this one, and tomorrow is a different one. So it's changeable. But also, furthermore, how I can balance between the two. We have prominent two presidents here, and one economic analyst we have, and also futurist we have, regardless of your background. And you can give us some kind of your personal advice so that our young generations can tackle this issue. 
I mean, it's how they, they can tackle this mismatch and then give us some good advice. Second point is that long time ago, Samsung CEO always claimed that destroy everything without, uh, except your wife. So-called destructive creativity. Creativity should be nurtured under the context of individual organizations. Samsung is different from LG. We know that. But how we can make wonderful adjustments at the same time, how we can nurture our creativity at work. I know it's a tough question, but however, nurturing creativity is very important one, so also you can give us some advice in your own way. And finally, all young generations now facing very difficult situations where given them some kind of constraint, constraint I mean it's an organizational constraint and a generational const constraint and a family constraint, they want to be independent by doing something what they want. But many, many constraints, constraints are they play a key role. The tackle this issue is a really hard one. So in the sense, how they can maintain their self-esteem by tackling this issue as a young generations. So why not give us your advice? Whatever you're welcome. So may I invite first speaker and then go ahead. Um, these are very deep questions that will take probably a very long time to give them proper answers. So I'm just going to um, just come up with some very brief answers, one of which is I want, this is, this is, this is when I have the opportunity to talk, to talk to our students, this is what I say. We do face some important challenges. One of the biggest challenges is the population increase. Okay, it's going to keep increasing, and it's uh, it may it's going to become uh, unsustainable, and it is going to become unsustainable. Our resources are limited, and um, environmental issues are a big challenge. And as soon as I say that, I don't mean to get anybody upset. I don't mean to. Uh, 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 create a pessimistic environment because I do re I, when, I, when I'm looking for solutions, I'm looking at our students. You are the ones who will find these solutions. Having said that, give yourself a chance to really enjoy the meaning of democracy. Really enjoy the meaning of freedom, freedom of expressing yourself freely, and make sure that that environment is always protected. That is the big picture. It is more important than, well, will I get this job? Will I get that job? And with that, give yourself a chance. There is all kinds of pressures. I know the culture, uh, various cultures, that it's not what you want. It's what your parents want you to do, okay? Give yourself a chance to say, this is what I am passionate about, and this is how I'm going to mobilize my passion and do something that will have significant impact and go crazy after that. Thank you. And, and before I ask uh, the uh, second speaker, uh, the, I mean, it's a uh, Ferdon, and uh, I think it's a poor should leave very on time. That is a 5.30 uh, to go to the airport. So. Uh, with your prior consent, and uh, may I request Paul, you go first. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Tom. Um, Thomas. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Tom. I'm confused. <laughs> sorry, tell me, sorry about that. Um, the, the internet is a very sophisticated communication tool, and it's enabling us to align the needs of a business with the talent of individuals in far more precise ways. In this, and the, the same token, it's also enabling people that are looking for work to align their skills and their desires and their motivations with opportunities in a more, more precise way. Um, we're moving into a freelance economy. 
and uh, very likely we're going to be transitioning into a period where you're doing one project after another project after another project. That's the seeds of entrepreneurship because you, you start off with projects like this and you get good at it, good at finding your next projects, and then you can um, uh, tackle the world in a vastly different way because um, you have the freedom to, um, to kind of take control over your own destiny. That, that's an important opportunity that uh, we all need to understand. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure I could go on with lots more uh, details here, but I think that, that probably covers it. Yes, uh, I, I'm very, uh, have a competitive mind. So if you have a competitive mind, the most important thing is to choose the field where you want to compete. Huh? The most important parents have to teach the children that they learn what is important and what is less important. They are very intelligent people who failed because they didn't concentrate on the important thing. And competition is, uh, can also be fun, and, uh, but it can also be very bad if you always lose. So you should look for the field where you have a chance to win. You should not 100% win, then uh, you are not <coughs> ambitious enough. You should be about win 70% uh, of the time. Eh? Uh, then you learn also what it means to lose. Uh, if you lose less than 50, uh, more than 50%, you have chosen the, the wrong competition. But 100% uh, winners, it's also suspicious. You could do more if you always win. You should be more ambitious. So, this is just a ballpark number, 70%. Steve Jobs also was very creative and he had the passion. He wanted to do what he want. He didn't ask anybody if it is correct in this, in this field. So he had enough energy really to compete to the end and he was a winner. So it also needs energy. Energy and choose the right field of competition. Thank you. Okay, Paul, please. Paul, please. Okay. Well, these are our really big questions, and I, I think we're opening up more ish issues rather than giving definitive answers. I, I guess I'd just say, say one thing um, as somebody who's more used to giving technocratic advice to governments than human advice to young people is um, reflecting in my own life um, make, when you make choices. It's important to be realistic and, and strategic and so on, but I think it's also important to think about is the choice you're making really consistent with your values? If, if it, what you're trying works out, will you feel good about yourself? Will you be, feel good about how your family will feel about you for having chosen the pursuits you did? And so I think, think about the values as well as uh, other factors such as economic factors or uh, what, what's likely to work. Thank you, and uh, I think this, uh, now is the time for me to conclude uh, this wonderful session, and, but uh, uh, I know that uh, we can look forward to further questions from the floor and more interactions are uh, uh, really absolutely needed but because of the time constraint and then I have to have a few remarks. Uh, per, uh, the paradigm they emphasize the notion of entrepreneurial graduates. I think it's a wonderful concept. And uh, Ralph, well talking about, well matched between higher education and dual um, op 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 I'm sorry, apprenticeship. I'm sorry there. And uh, Paul emphasized the ways to tackle market tourism in Korea. And uh, Tom, He's talking about 10 items, and out of that, and then what struck, uh, the struck me was that uh, uh, micro cottages. I think it's a pretty, this is a really uh, wonderful aspect. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> we welcome and, and appreciate, and uh, we really hope to uh, bon voyage. We can see you again then.